Welcome to episode 6 of Making It, a bi-weekly podcast about making things with your bare hands, hosted by Jimmy DiResta, Bob Claggett, and myself, David Petrudo. And we're going to start this off by talking about what we got going on in the shop. Who wants to go first? I'll go. All right. Um, this is Jimmy. Actually, this has been a really cool week. It's been a nice inspirational week for me. Typically, between Christmas and New Year's, I, I kind of just go into the shop and play around. And so this week, I decided to start four movies. So I have no client nice. work this week. So I started four movies. I'm Instagramming some of the pictures. I started a, a knife video, but the knife is a crisp blade, which is a wavy Malaysian blade. So I try to pick something extremely complicated just so I could learn something new. And that's really why. Because I can make a regular knife, and but I never made a wavy knife. So I l- I've already learned a tremendous amount just doing that. And I'm not even done with that. And then I started turning my cut down tree from a few months ago. I'm turning it into a set of country farm table legs. I'm going to lay each one into a, like a nice farm leg. And so I might just make that a video on its own, of just the legs, and then the building of the table will be a part two. But they'll both stand alone. And um, I started a bandsaw restoration for this old 1950s bandsaw I got. I'm going to turn it into a metal-cutting bandsaw with a slow, powerful motor. Mm. And then uh, I, got a, I got a plasma cutter from the guys at Longevity. So I started making a sign for my friend's motorcycle shop with the plasma cutter so i'm excited about that cool and uh yeah and then i got to visit nat benjamin who's a boat builder this week in martha's vineyard i'll talk a little bit more about that but that was an extremely inspirational trip it was amazing to see what this guy has and how how he does the things he does amazing bob i'm curious i'm curious about that knife actually oh yeah how how do you how do you sharpen that yeah um i saw the picture of it i can't even imagine is it just elbow grease yeah, you know, it's just I, I to get that fine shape. I used a couple of tools. You know, the tra- knife traditionists are going to they're going to skewer me. No pun intended. I'm sure they're all going to be like, "You can't do that. That's not the way to do it." But I did it, and I got a beautiful knife. And the blade is nearly done. I just have to figure out what the handle is going to be. Is the blade curvy like that for a particular reason, or is that just all aesthetics? Just from my research, I've been able to do. I haven't found anybody on YouTube that that has made one except for documentaries about Malaysia and Indonesia. And that's where the knife originated from. And it's really more just a ceremonial knife. And it's really meant only for stabbing. So it's not necessarily meant for like cutting meat or anything like that or, or skinning a cow. It's just a ceremonial stabbing knife. If anybody comes near you, you just poke them with it. That's really what it's about. So the tip is very sharp. And um, they've used these knives. Also, they've kind of stolen that style for a lot of stilettos, Italian stiletto switchblades use the crisp blade. Mm-hmm. And Kissing Cranes makes a famous uh, knife, alleged to be the knife that a- O.J. used in his murder, in his alleged murder. Uh, he used the crisp blade Kissing Cranes with a bone handle, which is like an 18-inch knife when it's fully opened. It's like a 7 or a 9-inch nine, nine knife when it's opened. It's that long. Uh, so I've seen them around for years, and I just decided most of those are just one edge. The one I'm making will have two edges. You know, It'll be sharp on both sides. And it's just a matter of getting down to that little fine edge and just being careful not to not to burn through it and uh, it's like i said it's been it's been uh, trying to keep that ridge too right down the center is really difficult trying to keep that ridge is sort of centered and and it's not 100 percent perfect on camera it looks perfect but when you hold it in your hands you can see some discrepancies but of course i'll hide all those discrepancies on camera yeah <laughs> <laughs> might, might as well <laughs> the, power, the power of editing <laughs> yeah bob what's going on with you uh well i've been off work for the last couple weeks actually which has been amazing um and so i've just been doing a lot of like infrastructure stuff in the shop a lot of cleanup and a lot of reorganizing and uh cleaning up my office as well and trying to put stuff away you know just trying to prepare for a lot of work of next year but i did start uh upgrading the spindle on my cnc machine oh nice which is really really cool so and it was surprisingly easy to do and so i did that and then i ended up making a cab like a small cabinet to put underneath the CNC to hold all the electronics. So kind of crammed all that stuff into one side and then the other side will, I'm making a drawer just to put, you know, CNC bits and Allen wrenches and all that kind of stuff that you need around uh, for it. So that, yeah, lots of cleanup. What about you, David? Speaking of cleanup, that's basically what I've been doing the last week. Uh, the last project that I did was the recasing of my Sony speakers, and I put that video out a couple weeks ago. Look great. Oh, thank you. 
And then since then, just cleaning up the shop. And in, right now, it's the cleanest and most organized it's ever been. I, I just, like, I have to go down into my basement to do laundry, and I just look at it, and I'm like, ah, I want to go make something right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's so inviting right now. Um, I'm getting ready to make a new coffee table for our living room, and I just got the hardware in that I need for it, where the, the top of the table is going to lift up and then move towards you so i can use it as like a little computer stand or we can use it to eat in front of the television or whatever so oh that's really cool yeah very cool talk about cleanup shop by my shop is always like in a state of extreme messiness partially cleaned partially dusty and then when i visited nat benjamin at gannon benjamin boats in martha's vineyard his shop is like well-worn, worse than mine. He's been there for 30, 40 years. They've been in the same shop. But it seems like they just gave up on organizing <laughs> probably about 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he's like me because in the way that he says people bring him things because he thinks they think that he can use them in his boat bills. And he just says, well, if you want to leave it, you can leave it over there. And so he said all along the wall. And he said to me, and uh, I was with Nick and, and Taylor, he said, if you want to take any of this stuff, take it. People just leave it and tons of stuff underneath <laughs> the bench covered in dust, like uh, like turnbuckles and porthole windows and all kinds of stuff that – because Martha's Vineyard is a whole shipping community. And so boats and boats decay and all the parts that look seemingly good come to his place. And so I, I, I felt vindicated that my shop is a disaster typically most of the time and so was his. But he puts out these beautiful, gorgeous boats. Look up the movie Charlotte. And you'll see where I visited, and the and Benjamin is who I met. Uh, Nat Benjamin is his name. Yeah, it was it was an incredibly inspiring trip for me. So it was great. Now I want to build a boat. So. <laughs> nice. You got to chop down a tree on your property and then turn it into a boat <laughs> with a, your with your axe that you made. Not a bad idea. I'm telling full, you, full circle. I'm, I'm becoming more and more of the mindset of Dick Pernicky, which is like, what can I make completely from a tree? And so. Like I said, this one video I'm working on is uh, table legs. But the table legs, once they're finished, will look like they came off of a lathe, you know, like a, a computer lathe. That's the plan anyway, to try and make these beautiful farmhouse legs, try and take it completely away from a gray, rotting tree. But uh, we could talk more about that when it's finished. But uh, the subject of today's podcast is a question all three of us get quite often. And it's a question, how do I quit my job and do what you do? which is what a lot of people want to do. Dave, you could attest to that because you've recently quit your job and you're doing what you do now, which yeah. is just full-time building and full-time blogging and full-time video. Right. And would you like to start the conversation on this since you were the, the most current victim? <laughs> victim. <laughs> is that the right word? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it's a natural progression. You know, you, you kind of know when to quit your job you you can't just like hey i'm gonna i'm gonna quit today and start making videos because you're not gonna make any you're not gonna make any money right off the bat it's a slow gradual progression of making videos and 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 i make money from selling plans i make money from the ads in the videos i make money from ads on the website and affiliate links and from what i understand i think it kind of happened pretty rapidly with me because i i've had the drunken woodworker name and facebook account for couple of years now, but I just started really doing the YouTube videos in January. And so that's when I really consider when, when it started. Every month I seemed to make a little bit more and a little bit more and my following got a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And all of a sudden I could not grow my channel anymore because I just had no more time to put into it. And we sat down here in the house and Kelly and I had a good conversation and we thought, you know, it's we're looking at the growth. I think we can keep going on with this. I'm in a very different position from both you guys. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I, I think one thing that's interesting about this as a topic is people, it, is the way that the question has been asked. And it's been asked in a few different ways. But in this particular instance, this email that we got, it was, how do I quit my job? Mm-hmm. Right? It's not, it's not, why do I, why do I want to quit my job? What do I want to do? It's like the, pro- how, and maybe they didn't mean it that way, but it's like the process of how do I back out of something that I'm already in, that I'm committed to, that I don't really like, but I need, how do I get out of that into the thing that I want to do? And I, I think that's the wrong question, honestly. I, I, don't, I think you'll find a way out of mm-hmm. the thing that you don't want to be in, 
I think the bigger question and the thing that they need to, fo- that we all need to focus on is what do I want to do? You know, like, what am I, what's my goal? What am I chasing? Because once you figure that thing out, and that's a hard money, it's easier said than done, right? But once mm-hmm. you figure that thing out, then you've got your, you've got your direction. You've got your motivation is going to come from that. And it's going to be a lot easier to figure out the how, you know, the how is just well, I think making stuff happen. I think when people say, how do I quit my job? It's how do I earn the money that I'm earning right now and replace it and make more? I think that's the real big question. It's like, if you, if you're on an income thousand dollars a week or $2,000 a week, whatever it might be, it's like, how do I quit working as a manager or whatever it is that I don't like doing? Maybe it's you're working on a carpentry crew. Maybe you're working at a retail shop. You want to get away from that and you want to be in charge of that money that comes in because you create things with your own hands that you're exchanging for that money directly. And you're not working for a boss or you're not working for somebody. And in my, my personal experience and my whole life has been making things for money, either you know, in the framework of working for somebody or working for myself. I've always been making things in exchange for money, physical objects, whether it would be prototypes or you know, built-ins or cabinets or signs. Um, but I think the building a clientele is really the most important thing and building a clientele and building the confidence to be able to charge what you're worth. You know, I, I talked to there's several friends that I talk through around the world, you know, because of the internet, you know, I, I'm sort of their life coach when it comes to them developing their handy work in exchange for money. You know, I can only give them so much advice on what they're doing, but it's a matter of developing the confidence to say, hey, this thing I just made is worth $500 as opposed to saying this thing I just made is worth $20 because it's just a $20 piece of wood. I mean, that's a, that's the biggest hurdle for people that haven't been brought up uh, in a life of making things in exchange for money. It's like, hey, this piece of wood only cost me $20, but how can, even though I just seen and seed it and I put a little blood and sweat into it, it only took me two hours. So if I sell it for 30 bucks, wow, that's 10 bucks I just made. But there's a moment in time when you can sell that same amount of wood with that same perspiration for 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of context. It's a matter of the right client. It's a matter of exactly what it's used for. And you could do the same thing with a piece of pine or you can do the same thing with a piece of coca bola, and all of a sudden the perceived value goes through the roof. So it's just a matter of all these different combinations of things. And, uh, and I find that one of the most important things is developing your confidence and developing your clients. Uh, to be able to look somebody straight in the face and say, that's going to be $20,000 half up front and, you know, not urinating your pants because you're either afraid or you just can't believe they're about to write you a check is, you know, it just takes a lot of confidence to get to that point or to turn mm-hmm. around. Like I was just talking with Nick, we were just in the car ride going to Martha's Vineyard and we were just talking about the price of slab tables and slab tables have a very high perceived value. You know that the slab you just bought from the lumber yard or from the sawmill was two hundred dollar piece of walnut or whatever it was, and you turn around, you polish it, you put a couple of bow ties in it, you make a steel frame, and then you could, in the right context, you can sell it for fifteen grand. But it's just a matter of developing those contacts, developing those clients, and developing that confidence. And it just comes with practice and practice and practice. You guys have any thoughts on that? Before I yeah, get no, I, I, I do for the, that development. I mean, you're totally right. The the development, I think, is the how maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So that's one of the big questions is how do you do those things that you just mentioned? How do you get to that point yeah. um, while making a living? Right. There, there's a, there is an overlap. There almost has to be an overlap. There has to be a. Um, and, and so that's probably the how that they're talking about, you know, how do I live two lives at the same time, one to make the other possible, you know? Um, and there's an interesting book that I listened to called Quitter by John Acuff. He's a a really funny author and I listened to it about a year ago. And in his whole thing with this book was that he was a graphic designer wanted to be a speaker and a presenter and and a teacher and a coach and all these different things. And so he would work graphic design during the week on the weekends. He would fly somewhere, you know, like from the office, fly somewhere, do a weekend retreat with a company or whatever the thing was, fly back on Monday morning, come from the airport to his office, change clothes in the bathroom and go back to work. And that was his life, you know, and he was living two lives and he wanted so badly to quit his day job to do this thing full time, but this full time thing wasn't at the point where, you know, it would actually pay for his life and it wasn't 
you know, it was growing like a lot of the things that we're doing are growing, but they're just not quite to where, you know, they can, it can take over yet. So the point of this whole book was really interesting because I thought it, you know, it's called quitter. So you're thinking it's going to tell me how to quit my job. It's going to tell me the process I need to go through to do this. And it ends up being a lot more about figuring out the dream that you have, figuring out the thing that you want and figuring out how to leverage the situation that you're currently in to make that thing possible. And all the while, not hate your day job, right? <laughs> not <laughs> hate the place that you're in, but find value in it and find the things in your current state that you can hone, that you can use to make your projected goal yeah. possible, you know, to get there without, you know, without <clears throat> abusing it. But, you know, take advantage of the fact that you're surrounded by really creative people or you're, you have some, you know, something you have access to something at your current job that you wouldn't have later or things like that. So it's really interesting for anybody wanting to take that type of plunge. It may be, it's one opinion. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Talking about like things that you might have at your current job that you won't have later. There's a lot of behind the scenes things that you have to deal with. Once you quit your job, you're no longer contributing to your 401k or IRA. Uh, you're not going to have health insurance. Uh, all of a sudden, you got to do your own taxes, uh, which is a little bit more complicated. And you actually have to pay more taxes because your employer, when you had a job, paid part of your taxes for you. But now you got to pay more taxes if you're self-employed. And you got to work on your own your own time management. And uh, that's all stuff that I'm I'm learning right now how to how to deal with. Yeah. Well, you want to hear something interesting. I haven't had health insurance in 22 years at all nothing and i don't i don't have any plans on having it <laughs> and and i've cashed my ira out two times because mm. i've gotten that close to the bottom mm. i had a beautiful gorgeous 1976 eldorado convertible which was my prized possession at the time i turned around and sold it for twenty thousand dollars on an instant because i got that close to the bottom i mean a few times it's uh, you know people have this misconception that i'm very wealthy because of my tv shows but they've only ever cost me money because I put everything else aside to do them in hopes of, you know, get, you know, the bigger grabbing the bigger golden ring, golden ring, you know, for the AOL commercial or something like that. And none of that ever came through. And I talked about that in a previous podcast where, you know, you keep thinking, oh, this is going to be the one that sets me free financially. And, and in my instance, that, that in my examples, it's never happened for me. So um, I'm doing well now, obviously. I mean, I'm doing better than I ever have but I'm still not financially free. I can't turn around and, and add health insurance to the list. You know, I do have life insurance that if I drop dead, you know, a few of my friends are going to be able to have a party, but <laughs> 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 that's just so my property doesn't go to the bank. Honestly, um, it stays in the family, but I do want health insurance and, you know, I do, I do want to, I, I just started another 401k last year. For the first time in about three years, I started another one and, uh, you know, there's a few bucks in it it's growing and I contribute to it. So that's good. Um, but these are the things when you work for yourself, my brother came to me, we had our own prototyping shop in the summer of, uh, 99. We had, uh, one more year left on our lease in this big space we rented. He came to me and he said, we're broke. We have nothing. We're not going to be able to make it more than a few months. I spoke to the landlord and they said that they'd be willing to give us, you know, we, they'd be willing to take the place back in September. And now this is like the beginning of August. And so we had a month. We thought about it for a few minutes and then turned around and said, okay. And that day we just began giving things away because we had nowhere to go. We had been in that space for five years and we made the plans to just get out of it and literally like change plans on a dime because you have to be able to be that flexible if you work for yourself. You know, of course, if you have a home and stuff, it's a different story. You want to be able to maintain that. But when you have like a location or business or, you know, you got to be able to be that flexible, you know, and just know that the changes that you make are for the better. Yeah. And say, you know what, out of, out of, you know, seeming disaster comes growth. And, uh, and every time I've, I've, and that's just one example of a few of them in my life. Uh, every time I've done that, it's always been, it's always been a growing experience for something altogether new. So, I mean, I, I've been lucky that way. I'm tapping wood. I, you know, I always hope that uh, out of these things comes growth and you just got to kind of keep that positive mode. And then talking a little bit about keeping your foot on home base that you were talking about, Bob, 
there have been times in my life where I took jobs internally at companies as a subcontractor, but I'm bound to like a nine to five. And they have only been for short stints. And most recently at a toy company in 12 into 13, I did the Viewmaster stuff. And a couple of months in, I realized that it really wasn't fun, but it was a steady paycheck. And that's every morning I went to work. I was like, you know what? I'm using this to get out of the little hole I'm in. By the time I'm done, I'm going to have this much money in the bank. So it was like being on a diet. You just know that at a certain point, you're going to be through it. It's going to be done. And then I'm going to be on to what else is next. And, you know, if you keep it in your mind that this is just a stepping stone or a ramp into the next part of my life and you mentally settle into it and it doesn't seem like such a laborious task, yeah. you know, you're going to work every day knowing that every day you're chipping away towards your goal, which is to work for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's another part of that, that long-term growth though, is I think you have to, you have to be really uh, aware of the fact that you have to chase it. Yeah, right. you know, you every have, day, I mean, it's got to be in your you heart. Can't, yeah, it's not, it's, you know, you get a nine to five, you get a full-time job and you settle in and you do the work that you're given and you, you know, it works that way. But I would imagine, and I can't speak from experience that, you know, when you branch out on your own in something like this, where you're basically everybody that you make something for is your, is your boss, right? So you end up having a bunch of bosses and, Absolutely. and you have to, I would assume you have to just stay really motivated to just work all the time. <laughs> just oh, yeah. It, no. you know? And then, you know, even in, in, and in my free time, which uh, thank God lately, I don't have too much of free time, meaning no work, no clients, no jobs pending. Um, I make, you know, in the past I've made things, I've used that time to, to make things. And, you know, obviously now every free time I have is used to make a movie because I have that whole new avenue of income or, you know, of experience in work making movies has basically become part of my day job, which I love. I mean, it's like the, the most rewarding job I've ever had is making movies, but fill up your dead space. If you want to make things for a living, fill up your dead space, making things to add to your portfolio. Um, a friend of mine, once uh, one of my online friends um, asked me, Hey, I'm sick of making signs for people. I want to be able to make everything for people, not just signs. How do I do that? And I said, make what you want to put in your portfolio and just tell them it was for a client. No one's going to know that it wasn't. I probably said that before on this because it's a good example. And he said, wow, that's a great idea. So if you want to use up your free time, if you don't have clients, make things that you want to sell. And then this way you could tell other people, hey, I made this for this restaurant in some other city that you're never going to visit because I'm lying to you. I made this for my aunt, <laughs> which I don't have an aunt, but you don't know that. And I right, made right. this, this is, you know, I'm, oh, I made this. I sold this for $600. I can make you one. And then when they say, yeah, make me one, you give them the one that's in the picture. They don't know it. Yeah. Sell them that one to $600. I'll only give it to you for five. Oh, wow. Thanks. And they have no idea. No one has to know anything. You know, it's all white lies that only benefit everybody. They're not. Well, I mean, you're, you're making the things. If you actually make the things, you're, you're not lying. You know, you're doing, you're creating yeah. examples of your work. And I, I, that's really common. I, David and I have talked about that before as yeah. web designers. Like when you're, you get out of school. Yeah. You want to prove the fact that you know how to make a website, you make your own site and you make fake sites mm -hmm. and you make, you know, just to show that you can do it. Yeah. 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 And no. the, the most important thing is to just keep making something every day, you know, and don't wait for client work. You know, that's, that's a lot of people make that mistake of like they wait for the phone to ring. And I think you really have to keep developing your skill set. You know, I make, I learn new stuff every single day and I've been doing this my whole life. I mean, I learned some new stuff over the weekend we were talking about. It's, you know, things that'll stick with me. And that's what I talk about in that little article on the Make a Pro book is how things stick with you once you teach yourself stuff. Yeah. Oh, we should bring that up. That's a perfect... Sorry, David, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. <laughs> Let's talk uh, about that. So there's a book, a new book that we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Um, and Jimmy wrote an essay for it. It's called Make a Pro, put out by Make Media. And it's... Let me find the... Uh, it's Essays on Making a Living as a Maker is the title for it. So... For anybody interested in this topic, this is actually a, a really good, uh, you know, thing to, to check out. I got my copy in. Jimmy's waving it around on the camera. We both got one. So I'm really interested to uh, to read it and find out, you know, th there's a lot of different types of people on here. And I've only read uh, part of one. So Jimmy's on here. Uh, there's a bunch of people that are doing electronics work, people that have started different companies, uh, people that work at SparkFun, uh, magazine, you know, there's a 3D printing, sculpting. There's a lot of different types of people. So I would imagine these essays probably cover a pretty. And the, the, the good thing about, about this book, it's about everybody's essay about becoming a quote unquote professional. So it's like taking your hobby and making it your career. 
which is goes exactly to what we've been talking about. Yeah. 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 This I, is, it's a great book by uh, John Biacchali. How the hell do you say his name? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How do you say that? Anybody have an idea? Johnny B. Johnny B. He's <laughs> a nice guy. We've been talking, actually. I, I, I've invited him to help me try and write something, so we'll see if it comes to fruition. Nice. I'm going to have to pick a copy up for myself. I, I will say that, um, you know, since I, I just made this change to being self-employed a few months ago, that successes as a self-employed person are far more rewarding than successes that I had working for somebody else. Because, yeah. um, you know, previously it was a team effort. And so you all kind of share in that success or or the stress of getting to that end point. And now when I complete a project or whatever I'm doing, it is extremely satisfying. And that's why I love doing what I'm doing because there's no better feeling than putting out a new project and getting great feedback or just taking a step back and looking at what you did and think, you know, I made that. That's amazing. You know, so the rewards mm. are far greater working for yourself. Oh, for sure. I mean, like when I look at my channel and, you know, the videos that I've amassed right now, I'm so proud of myself because I think of all the conversations I've had with groups of television people and where the, I, I brought these ideas up and, you know, everybody's naysayed them for one reason or another. And now I don't have any of that naysaying and it's all just me. And I feel like I, I, I feel because I'm building an audience the way I am and, you know, I'm inspiring people that I feel like I was right the whole time and all these naysayers throughout the several episodes of TV shows I've ever done. You know, so revenge is the best reward. I was just saying, hey, see, look, I told you so. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's part of my motivating factor. You know, it's obvious, I think. But I'm, uh, I'm curious about. I'm curious yeah. about David. The mm, it's. I understand the 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 reward being better, right? It being more true to you and more personal and more. What's the? Or is there a way that you can balance that or compare that to the fear? I mean, there's got to be some fear to it, right? You quit your job. Well, it was, of course, there was a little bit of fear in quitting your job, but it was. And maybe, maybe I mean, maybe I mean long term fear, not yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the fear of leaving, but yeah. I, I could answer some of that because uh, there have been yeah. moments in my life where, where I'm, where I've got my last paycheck and these moments have been, you know, in the recent past, I've got my, I've gotten the last bump. Okay. I paid my mortgage. I paid all my rents, which I have a few of, and I paid all my car payments and all this other stuff. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wow. I need to come up with another 10 grand for the end of the next four weeks and I don't have any money. And so like, that's sort of the long-term thing. And then I, I try not to panic. And if I really do have some downtime, I literally walk around the neighborhood and see where there's construction. And I walk in and I hand my business card because if there's a crew ripping out a store, I know they're going to need fixtures. They're going to need a sink. They're going to need a counter. They're going to need chair. They're going to need benches. So I walk around and, and still, if they're building a store in my neighborhood, I walk in, I go, who's the guy in charge? Here's, here's a business card. Look me up online. I build stuff. That's what I say. And I walk out. And, you know, I usually try and give them something interesting. My business card has my brain on it so people remember it. But, you know, I've gotten that lower. I literally just go knocking on doors. And then then I'll get a phone call. may not be directly from that particular, uh, you know, solic solicitation week. But I, I've always been lucky with, with something has come through. And, you know, I, I've been to the point where I'm like, hmm, is this the month I'm going to sell my Harley? Is this the month I'm going to sell one of my pickup trucks? You know, like I said, that's only been like in the last five or six years. It hasn't been, you know, in the last year. But mm. I have had those points where the fear has started to creep in. Yeah. And I just look around. I'm like, what can I get rid of to pay, you know, to pay this bill or that bill? To answer your question, I really don't have that much fear right now. Um, there's a saying, if you're dumb, hang around smart people. Because you're you're <laughs> the right. sum of your surroundings, <laughs> and so yeah. I lately I've been surrounding myself with successful people, and I get to see what these people are doing, and that includes you two and people like Jay Bates, and then Thank some you. of my friends ar around town. Like if you surround yourself with successful people, you're just going to absorb that success, and it's I really don't have that much fear right now. I, I have a lot of confidence in, in what I'm doing and I'm seeing growth and I don't see any reason for it to not continue to grow. So I, mm -hmm. and I don't want to focus on the negative right now. I, I want to focus on all positive stuff. So I push the yeah. fear aside. Yeah. To clarify yeah. what I was saying too, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of fear that sets in. I mean, and this has been my overall experience, a little fear sets in, but then all of a sudden you start to think, okay, this is a game. 
I got to figure out how to solve the puzzle to these games. Mm -hmm. And this is a game where, you know, I got to try and come out on top and you literally approach it analytically, you know, like a problem solver and not necessarily like, oh my God, I'm going to go broke. I'm not going to pay this credit card on time. Just literally just say, okay, how am I going to solve this problem? This is a problem like any other mechanical problem. It's just a matter of what am I going to exchange for money? And, you know, obviously it's your services and your tech, your expertise and your skill and the things you build and the services you can provide. If it's being a handyman for a couple of weeks, then you go and you fix somebody's house up. When you, when you hit those, those low points in your, in your career, isn't that when you found yourself to be the most creative? Of course, because then you start doing things because, you know, you're not doing that one regular bar job or, you know, or like I had this one client that I worked for a lot and I, I still owe her a phone call, but she owns, she was a Russian she was a manager to a Russian restaurant firm. And I say firm, they own like 75 restaurants around the world. But then they would call me and they would give me huge jobs to do. But the biggest problem is I was always stressed out because they were like, we need 35 tables built by the end of next Monday. I'm like, that's six days from now. And, you know, but then my whole life goes into turmoil trying to deliver. They would always have these emergency deadlines. I lost my train of thought. What did you ask, Bob? The Dave? What did you ask? Well, we're just like what you you become mo- most creative when you when oh. you reach those low points because that's when oh, yeah. that's when you have to do something to to survive. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, in, when I reach one of those low points, I would I would call this restaurateur and I would say, "What do you got for me?" And then they would go, "You mm-hmm. know what? We have this broken thing, or we have this thing that needs to be fixed and rebuilt in this other section, or you know what? We want to add a whole rack of shelves to the back of this bar at this. Re-. They have like twenty restaurants in and around the New York area, and but they have like ten guys like me that do all these things. And you know, you're the flavor of the month. That's why I haven't been working for them lately because I also haven't been soliciting them, but. They find but you have it. that you have that contact, and it's a totally. place that you can reach. Yeah, yeah. and That's so awesome. when it gets low, I would call them. And I, I, the only reason, like I said, I started making the example before I lost my train of thought was I would call them, and then all of a sudden I would have nothing to do to have too much to do, and it would be so stressful in the other direction of like, mm. oh my god, they're going to give me twenty thousand dollars worth of work, but it has to be done in like ten days, and that means going and laying out all this money. And, you know, of course, you get some money up front. It's yeah, you a, mentioned it's, it's a hustle. It's always a hustle, but you know, like I said, the hustle is the puzzle and is is part of the game and is part of the fun. And yeah, it's, it's part of the excitement. You, interesting you said hustle. That that book I was talking about earlier, um, the quitter, he he talks he has a chapter called Hustle, I think, and it's just about that. It, so when I listened to the book, it got me thinking. I always associated the word hustle with someone who takes advantage of other people, right? You think of like a pool hustler or something. I, that's that's the the association that I had. Listening to this book, I just completely changed my whole uh, approach and understanding of that word, which sounds kind of stupid. But it in my particular situation, I got a full-time job. I have this thing that I want to do really, really badly. I have a family that I really, really love and want to spend time with. But you are the only, aren't you? And I, and I am, but that, that's my point. The, the only way that I can do that is by this new understanding of the word hustle. It's that every moment I have is valuable to me, maybe not to anybody else, but every moment I have is valuable, and it has to be focused on something. One of those three things, right? The, the thing that's my job, my day job that's allowing this other stuff to happen, the thing that I love doing, or the people that I love. And so... Once I figured out that the only way all those things can happen at the same time is for me to just bust on it and just to motivate every moment to one of those three things, yeah. that changed the way that I looked at my time and changed the way that I looked at all three of those things and their, their value and their, their value relative to everything else in my life. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that, you know, even if, maybe you're not, maybe this person who's asking this question is not in the same situation as me. Uh, where they want to keep a job and and do this other stuff, but whatever it is, I think you have to figure out the the one or two or three or ten things that are worth you laying everything else aside for and chasing, you know. Um, and, and another point that's unrelated to that, but you said something about a uh, credit card earlier, which got me thinking about if you did want to make this jump, and this is just a suggestion, not a rule or anything. But I think making that jump would be a lot easier if you spend the time up front getting <laughs> Jimmy's holding up a stack of credit cards, <laughs> getting rid of getting rid of of your debt. You know, I, that's something that's easier said than done. It's very difficult. Um, but I know from personal experience, I used to have a, an enormous amount of credit card debt, 
enormous. And I spent, you know, a year doing freelance work at night with the sole purpose of getting rid of that debt. And I got rid of every single bit of that debt. And so, you know, now that that's gone, that's one of those things that I don't have to worry about. It's not worrying about making sure I'm spending enough time with my family and doing the videos and my job and the fact that I have a huge amount of debt. You know, it's, yeah. no, it's that's funny. just one stress that's, that's gone. I, you know? I totally, but I've been there where my credit cards have been maxed to 75 grand and then back down to zero and then back up to 60 and then back down to zero. And that's all while working for myself. And I jokingly show you this giant stack of credit cards. I, I'm in a really good position now with my credit. I'm, I'm totally caught up. But this giant stack of credit cards to me is an emergency net. That's how mm-hmm. I think of it. If things go, all go, ha- go to hell, I got about $200,000 in credit right here. I'm holding it in my hand. Yeah. Not saying I can pay it back, but I can borrow it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I know I could borrow it. I know I could borrow it next month if I needed it. If I needed to buy a new truck or if I needed to buy a new table saw, I can do it in an instant. And you know, that's yeah. all towards the greater good of using that as bridge funding to get to another step somewhere in, in the in the product of making things for myself yeah. and for my clients. And, and, and you've got that in your belt as a tool. Yeah. Right? Not, that's, that's, not as, a, as a weight to stop you from doing the things that you want to do. No, that's, no, that's more what I'm talking about, you know, ahead of time before you make that jump. But, yeah, no, no. But I totally know that feeling though when you're like, you write that last check and you're like, all right. Now, yeah. now I have 100% credit on all these cards again. I can build it all up as long as I need to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But I've been that way. Like you write that last payment off and you're like, wow. And now yeah. it's totally managed now for me, but I'm talking about when I was really hustling with my brother in the, in the invention and development business. So, I mean, we, we had some, we were out on some pretty thin limbs there every once in a while, but we, we were always able to manage to pull ourselves back in. And then you know, it's part of the excitement is, you know, figuring out the game, making the game work for you, yep. you know, without going totally belly up. And thank God I've never had to go bankrupt, but a, clo- a few of my close associates had, had gone bankrupt. But when they went through it, they're just like, hey, you know what? This is just a bump in the road. I'll work my way out of this. It's all about having the right attitude. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's like, you know what? I got my health. You know, when people say that, there's a certain moment in time when that really actually means a lot. And you say, you know what? I got my health. Mm. All these things could fall away. I got my health. I can always build my business back up. You know, certain health ailments are just, you know, for detrimental and thank god you don't have those detrimental health issues because if you're physically able and able-bodied you could pretty much do anything you set your mind to absolutely yeah so that's a little deep i'm sorry to go that way <laughs> <laughs> hey it's part of life i mean you know when you're talking about this this type of thing it's that's it's huge and it's personal and everybody's going to have a different set of fears a different set of motivations a different set of stuff and you know health and focus and all that stuff is a part of it. So part of what's interesting is talking about this is that there's no answer in my opinion, right? Yeah, no, you just got to hustle. That's it. You just got to hustle and be confident. I mean, yeah. uh, one of my, one of my mentors, and we talked about doing a show about mentors and people that inspire us was my, my uncle Gene. He um, always, always wanted to work for himself. I mean, he had jobs where, but he always wanted to work for himself. He was married to my, my dad's sister, my, my aunt Dot. And me and my three brothers were inspired by him because he was always hustling. And he had seven kids and he was constantly mm. hustling. Like one day he had a brand new Cadillac and then it would get repossessed. And then he had a brand new Cadillac a couple of years later and then it get repossessed. <laughs> but he was always hustling, whether it was insurance or siding or one thing or another. He wanted more than anything was to earn his own money. Because to him, that, that was the most proudest to be able to say, I work for myself. And, uh, you know, he's always been, me and my brothers, I mean, he never made the millions of dollars he wanted to but he died trying. And me and my brothers always talk about him. I found that if you really, really want something like deep in you, you really want something, you always find ways to make that happen. And like, I mean, just think back to like when you're younger or when you're in college, you're like, Oh, I want a PlayStation two, but I make $5 and 25 cents an hour. All of a sudden you're like, once you, you, you're like, when you can't stop thinking about something, you find ways to make that thing happen. So you save up your money or you get money somehow to get that PlayStation 2 or whatever you wanted back in the day. And that's kind of how I feel about my career now. Like, I really want this to happen. This is my life and it's all I think about now. And I, I'm very confident that I'll be successful. You will be because yeah. you know why? Because you're a good guy. 
and you're honest and you, you know you put out a good product and you know you're opening doors for other people you know one of the most important things in life is to do good things for other people because it just comes back to you you know and i'm not religious in any way but i find that if you help people it comes back to you. It does. You know, at, at, at the end of the day, if you're destitute, you know you could pick up the phone and talk to me or Bob or any, you know, we're not the tightest of friends, but I would be more than willing to help you in any way. And I'm sure you have people around you that would do the same thing. So, you know, you're out on a limb, you're working for yourself, you're just getting started. There's no way people are going to let you fail. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. And that, that goes back to what you were saying earlier about who you surround yourself with too. You know, mm-hmm. that was a huge part. And, and I'm sure that you are locally surrounded by people who are you know, motivating you, continuing to encourage you to, to do that. And so to anybody asking this question, that would definitely be a first step is finding those people, mm-hmm. right? Finding yeah. those people around you that can, that, you know, you can count on for sure. Yep. No, and that's obviously friends and family, but you know, what helps too is finding someone that loves the work you do and somebody that's proud to say they have something that you made, you know, having a champion mm-hmm. in that way is really important. You know, we all have somebody that loves the work that we do and say, oh, my God, I can't believe I got another piece from you. You know, I have a couple of those clients and they are, I'm so grateful to have people like that in my life because I could even, I mean, if it gets down to it, I can call them and say, hey, you guys want, you want to front me some money for the next thing I build for you? Because <laughs> you know it's coming. <laughs> you know, that takes a lot of uh, cojones to do that. But, you know, sometimes you have to. Yeah. And they say, oh, sure, what do you need? Thousand, two thousand dollars $2,000? Yeah, whatever, whatever helps. <laughs> <laughs> At least. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, know, but- let's talk about how you surround yourself with the people that are successful. I'll, I'll start off by saying one way to do that. I live in Toledo, and so it's not a huge city, but it is a city. But there's a huge arts scene here, and there's all kinds of community st- stuff you can go to. There's meetups and and art shows uh there's stuff for entrepreneurs like i find just go start going to these community events eventually you're going to meet some people you're going to make new friends you're going to make new contacts and uh, that that's one way to surround yourself with these types of people i don't know if you guys have any other suggestions well i mean through my contacts at make a fair i've met a tremendous amount of of great people that have advanced my career i mean in the way of of my youtube channel you know, I, I, I can't deny my association with make has been tremendous for me. And that literally was because I answered a tweet that came when I did my TV show. I could have ignored it because I had just signed on to Twitter. But if I didn't answer that one tweet that came through from one of my friends at Make Magazine, who at the time was somebody, I was like, who, what is make? I heard of this thing. I don't know what the hell this is. I answered it. And then they said, oh, come down to Make Affair. And, and in my mind, I thought it was going to like a meeting, like in a church. I didn't know what the hell it was. And it turned out to be this like hugely wonderful thing that I, I had no awareness of. And simply because someone reached out to me on Twitter and I answered them back and then I gave them my email and then that little drip turned into everything that has become for me in the last four years. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's part of my identity now. And, and I'm so grateful for that. Not ignoring little things like this. You don't know, you know, people saying opportunity knocks at the strangest times. You just got to keep your awareness up and keep your feelers out. Yep. So we're all in the online space. We're all doing videos. We're on YouTube. We're posting things, you know, Facebook and all that. And I think being available for interaction is huge. It's been really huge for me in this last year and the amount of growth that I've seen. I think people are blown away or surprised at least that when they send me a message, I respond. And yeah. I and it's not just like a, hey, thanks response, like a thoughtful email, a thoughtful response. I, I look at the things that people send and that goes a long way into showing people that you're a real person that needs support, that needs encouragement, and that wants to share and be shared with, you know, the, the interaction goes both ways. And out of that, which is not, is not a tool, that's, that's like an authentic way to interact for me. Out of that has come a huge amount of support and a huge amount of motivation from people. And I see people that tell me they're inspired by something that I did, which just makes me want to do it even more, Mm -hmm. you know? So I think part of surrounding yourself with the people that you want to be around is just being really open to being available, you know, and, and making the effort, spending the time to interact. And, And that can be online or offline, but it's intentional because, well, at least for me, my natural, I think, response would be to like sit in my office, do my work, not really reach out, you know, not, not really be available, but, uh, finding that making the effort to be available 
has been good for me, good for my audience, and, and kind of just good all around. So I, I think that's a one good way to start. Absolutely. Well, same with me. I, I agree 100%. I mean, people people contact me, and it always pops up on my iPhone. I have everything forwarded. And it's so easy for me to answer it as I go. If I wait till the end of the day, I always forget. So I answer people right away, and they're always like, wow, you, I thought you were busy. <laughs> like, I am busy, but <laughs> I just stop for one minute to say hello. <laughs> You know, so it, it's good to do it as as I go, and it's the same thing. I, you know, I I'm so thankful that people want to watch and interact, and so it's it takes two seconds for me to say hello. Maybe one day there won't be the time for it, but while there is time, I always say hi if I can. Yeah, yeah. be thankful. That's another thing. Just be thankful. Yeah, for no sure. Doubt. So I, I, you know, the most important thing when you work for yourself, and I say this to everybody, is customer service. Be nice to your clients. I talk a little bit about it in my article. I'm talking about be open to communicate with your clients and manage their expectations. Get everything in writing because if it's just in the air, everything can be misinterpreted. If you guys have a conversation, just say, hey, there's a follow-up email. These are the things we talked about. And keep it friendly. It doesn't have to be like, I'm officiating this conversation into a piece of paper. <laughs> because if that ever needs to be re- referenced again, you could say, "Hey, remember I told you the thing is going to be blue, not green." It says it right here in this email. Do you remember? And they go, "Oh yeah, it is my mistake. I guess I didn't read that email." I'm like, "Hey, you answered it, but you didn't read it. What do you want me? To, what you, how am I supposed to know what you're thinking?" So you know, it's really important to manage your clients' expectations. Follow up. Hey, has the thing I built for you? Is it falling apart yet? Does it need any maintenance? Did somebody break it? You know, these kind of things, you know, oh, I'm too embarrassed to tell you my guy broke the drawer because he sat on it. I'm like, well, I'll be over in an hour and I'll fix it. Oh, my God, you don't have to do that. Well, I'd rather my piece of work that represents me not be sitting there broken. I'll come fix it. It'll take me an hour and, you know, we'll get back on track with a good reputation. Yeah. So Hmm. that's really important. You know, a lot of I get a lot of people who hear me talking to somebody like, oh, they went to move it and they broke it. You know, like that reception desk that I built, they went and moved it and they didn't take it apart to move it and something broke. So I went over and fixed it. And then one of my friends might hear me say that, and they're like, well, are you going to charge them? I'm like, no, why would I charge them? They just gave me a huge chunk of money to make that thing. <laughs> well, you're going over there again. I'm like, you know what? There's still a lot of profit in me going and spending an afternoon and just giving some goodwill. There's a lot of profit left. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, it's really important to just follow up with your clients and make sure they're happy and keep them happy. And if you know what? When, when I bring something to somebody and they say, oh, the color seems off. I'm like, you know what? Live with it. If you don't like the color in a month, we'll repaint it. And they're like, Really? I'm like, yeah, I'll repaint it. Whatever. And 99% of the time, nobody calls me back. You now they're like, oh, you know, but if I put up a fight, it's almost like almost someone's natural instinct to be like, oh, he's going to, he's going to make it, he's going to make this difficult. I'm going to make it difficult. Yeah. Mm. You know, I mean, and I've only seen that in other people, not me personally. Like I have guys I've shared my shop with, you know, they get contentious with their clients and then the clients put up a fight because they don't want to be, they don't want to be bossed around. I, with your customer service example, I have another example of that. I have an electrician here in town and he was a referral from somebody else. I didn't know him, had a problem, had called him over and he looked at it and, you know, was there for 10 minutes or something and, and uh, figured out what the problem was. And it turned out it was, it was a city like electrical problem, not anything in my house, not something he could fix. It, they'd have to call out the person, whatever, but he'd spent some time there and he put something else aside to come. And, um, and then, you know, did a little cleanup work on some other stuff. Anyway, so he's leaving. He starts to walk to his truck. And I'm like, hey, you know, what do I owe you? He's like, oh, nothing. I'm like, well, you, you know, you were here for 30 minutes. And he said, yeah, but next time you need an electrician, call me. Next time somebody asks for one, give him my name. Hmm. Yeah. And he left. Yeah. And I've given his name to probably 10 people. And I've had him <laughs> back to do work for me a couple of times. You know, It's a it's, great uh, example. A great he, example. He did it the right way, and he's somebody I trust and recommend. You know, every time I have the opportunity to. So that's I do the same thing when you know somebody needs something. I'll say, "Oh, how much?" I'm like, "Yeah, just give me, send me work." It's all send me work. Yeah, because it's yeah. no skin off my back. And you know, it's, sometimes I work for people like in my building where I, where I live. You know, people want a cabinet or this or that. I do it, and I just do it. I live with these people. I'm not going to, I don't want them to be like resentful because I charged them. You know, they probably thought they were going to pay a hundred. I charged them 150, whatever, you know, I just do it for them. They're my neighbors, yeah. you know, and then when, and then they're indebted to me, they, you know, they'll help me. They'll take a package from UPS for me or whatever. It's worth a lot more than, you know, getting, getting the money weird. itself. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right, cool. I think that's a pretty good place to wrap it up for this episode. Um, I wanted to, before we go, I wanted to, 
Make sure to say thank you to our patrons. If you are not a patron of the show, there's a thing called patreon.com and you can go there to patreon.com slash making it. And it's a way for you as a listener to help support the show, help us pay uh, for the hosting costs because it does actually cost us money to have the show online. Um, but the people that reward are, are on the, a certain level of reward, uh, I wanted to thank on the podcast, Nicholas Gomez, uh, Jacob M. Buell, I have to figure out how to say Jacob's name. Uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph Munch, Andreas Eckberg, Charlie Grauer, and Colby Beam. And Colby sent me a Christmas card. Mm. Thank you, Colby. Colby's oh, awesome. Sweet. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks so much for those guys. All of the patrons are yes. awesome. Yes. You're helping us continue Thank to you. do this, and we are very, very appreciative. So if you want to, you guys want to help out, go to patreon.com slash making it. So, uh, where can we find out more about everybody, David? You can find out more about me on my website at drunkenwoodworker.com. And that has the portal to all my social media accounts, plus a nice little blog on there. Nice. Uh, I'm at jimmyderested.com and then I'm on every other thing that uh, is connected to the internet. Usually just, just as my name, <laughs> I was, uh, I went and got my name as everything. So anything with just my name. And then I have this uh, book I'm involved in uh, called Maker Pro, Essays on Making a Living as a Maker out by Make Media. And uh, I did a TEDx in May, which just got published in December on the TEDx YouTube channel. So take a look at that. It's getting some good reviews. I'm proud of it. I was a little nervous and the audio is a little crummy, but I wasn't involved in any of that part of it. But um, it's up there and it's, uh, it's getting some good hits. So just Yeah, it was, it was good. good. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I need to practice yeah. it a little bit, but it was, you know, I just went up there cold with some notes, but uh, hopefully I get to do it again. Yeah. I've, I've actually got a TEDx talk as well. Oh, you up do? There somewhere. Yeah. From earlier in the year, it's about um, child's play, about how to help kids learn to make stuff in their play. So you can check that out. And everything else I do is at alectomakestuff.com. All the social media networks, you can find me. And, uh, yeah, I think that's about it for this episode. Thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.